you believe them. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Trick Question, and this is Bad Horse. Uh, actually, I'm not appearing. Uh, let's see. When I talk, do I appear as the big thing or guys in the audience? Uh, can you see me when I talk? Or is it just always showing Bad Horse? You can see me? OK, OK. Um, Usually the person who's talking, uh, oh, we both appear like the same size. Okay. And so everyone can see the, the uh, 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 little plush armada I have set up in the background. Okay. <clears throat> All right, everyone. Uh, hello. Uh, welcome to, what did we title this? I, I believe it's the, the Joy of Sad Fix. Uh, we're we're going to be talking today about uh, writing fan fiction. And specifically, um, you know, why people uh, enjoy reading fiction with tragic elements to it and why people uh, uh, write fiction with tragic elements. Uh, I, I think uh, Bad Horse is going to uh, start us off after, you know, a, a brief discussion here. Uh, what's that? I, I think uh, Bad Horse is going to uh, start us off after Hold on. discussion here. Yes, indeed. Uh, with that, put, uh, yeah, I'm going to put uh, my earphones in. I'm I'm With lagged that, by like uh, 20 seconds. Yeah, I'm going to put uh, my earphones in or one in. I'm I'm lagged. That, that horse, can you turn down your sound, please? Oh yeah, gotcha. Okay, so you can still hear. I did. All right, guys. Uh, ex exciting. But in any case, uh, uh, we are uh, the word I'm looking for. Um, we're here to talk uh, to you about uh, tragedy and tragic themes as they appear in both fiction and specifically in fan fiction. Bad Horse will start us off by uh, discussing, uh, you know, just sort of the phenomenon of uh, uh, tragedy and fiction and why people enjoy reading tragedy, uh, uh, different uh, possible reasons, uh, both psychological and, and uh, uh, otherwise. And uh, then I will go into uh, some amount of detail on the process of incorporating uh, a tragedy and sad and dark themes into fiction uh, in, in a way that uh, is actually useful to your viewers. Um, I think that's it pretty much. Uh, Batterist, do you have anything to add before you want to get started? Um, no, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. OK, excellent. Uh, not really, no. I'm going to open up uh, my own presentation and start. Uh, okay. I have not been able to find the chat room yet, so I can't see anything that people are saying. Um, I can let you know, but it's it's the channel writing stream audience. Uh, unfortunately, under, under the heading writing room in Ponyfest Online. Yeah, my my Discord just kept crashing, so I'm trying to get into the web version. Um, but all right, I'll you know what. I'm just going to trust you that there are people okay, out there. Dragon just just sent you a notification. Um, sorry, I I, I don't see it because I'm not I'm not on the uh, Pony Fest channels. Um, I'll I'll get to the chat room later. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Wait. What's what's the room? Sorry. Uh, writing stream audience. Writing Pony stream Fest online audience. Stream. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yes. I see there are in fact people there and I'm standing here making a fool of myself, but now I'm just going to share my screen, which I guess is the only way to, um, the only way to share slides. Okay. Yes. Yes. I'm aware oh, of I should have told you this was a G rated con before, uh, setting mm -hmm. up. We're all oh, everyone. Sorry, I'm having uh, time here trying to find, trying to maximize this. 
take up the screen. There and you go. This, and I don't know how you how you do a uh, slideshow in Google. In you Google. In the upper right hand corner. Ah, thank you. There you go. There we go. Okay, so the question at at hand is why do people like sad stories? Uh, a thing which I've written lots of sad stories. I've read lots of sad stories. I've given presentations on sad stories. And then after I uh, asked Trixie if I could be on her. Um, hold on a second. Hold on a second, Bad Horse. Uh, it, it looks like people are seeing a, a crop image. Uh, mm. I think what we need to do is um, hit escape, go back. Oh, I bet my resolution is too high, right? I don't know. Is it is the resolution too high? Is that what's happening? Uh, technical people in the audience. I'm going to switch it to 1920 by 1080 and see what happens. Okay. Keep changes. Present. And what do they? What do we see now? Can you see it now? Is it visible, people? Still no good. Okay, so escape. What we're going to do is we're just going to use this window, but uh, make it move it into the upper left by pulling the the lower corner up. So unmaximize it, and then uh, uh, grab the lower right hand corner. Oh, so uh, I see. You're saying that uh, it's cropped to the upper left. That's correct. That is correct. Right. The problem. Okay. And tell me when when it gets in there. Okay. Uh, make it like two thirds of the screen. It says. They must be running me at uh, 1280. 1280. How does how does how does that look, people? It's good now. Okay. Just just go with that. Uh, yeah. You're not going to use present. You're just going to use, you know, what's on the screen. Uh, you can make it a little bigger by pulling. Uh, yeah, I think you can remove the. Uh, well, don't don't do present. I think you can. If you go to view, you can get rid of that pane on the left hand side. That's what I'd like to do. I, uh, I do not see how to get rid of that. Grid view, zoom guides. Snap to um, no, show, no, yeah, no, 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 we'll, we'll, no. They can I'll read say. it fine. We'll, we'll just do it as is. Oops. <laughs> All right, let's go. If that's, some of these will be a little small. I'm sorry about this, folks. Uh, I'm old. Um, so yeah, people, and, and uh, even after, you know, writing lots of sad fics, reading them, giving presentations on them, I realized I still really don't understand why people like sad stories. I don't know why I like sad stories. Uh, and so I did something I rarely do, which is listen to other people. And I used Google to search around the internet to find other people explaining why they like sad stories and have sort of compiled some of them uh, some of the different reasons given, uh, and I'm going to hoping to to get to go over those reasons. Although my much of my time has been spent on technical difficulties, but yes, it does seem strange that people like sad stories. But we also like other strange things. You know, we like riding roller coasters and eating spicy food and watching horror movies. Um, well. One theory which I'm going to deal with at length because it's what they will tell you in school uh, is by Aristotle. So he was basically the first person I know of to ask, among other things, why do people like sad stories? This is in a, a lecture he gave, which is called The Poetics. What we have, The Poetics is actually a really liberal translation of some students' lecture notes that they took uh, when Aristotle was talking. Uh, Aristotle didn't write anything down. 
for this. But uh, he basically said that people watch tragedies, he was specifically talking about ancient Greek tragedies, in order to feel better. And his theory is that, you know, you they watch this tragedy and they feel pity and fear. And if they feel this enough, then it sort of flushes it out of their system and they feel better than before. And this is using what today we call the hydraulic theory of emotions, which says, you know, feelings build pressure unless you let them out uh, or, you know, you're going to do primal screen therapy is based on this theory, uh, which most psychologists today would say the theory is just wrong. Um, so is catharsis, in fact, for real? Now, these photos here, if you can see them, uh, is from a movie called The Naked Gun, where on the left, you see the two main characters walking out of a movie theater, laughing, uh, and just feeling great. And on the right, you see they, the movie they just walked out of was Platoon, which is a, a terrible, depressing tragedy. Um, and this, is, this was funny in the movie because it doesn't happen. Nobody walks out of Platoon feeling happy. Um, so do people ever really feel cleansed by tragedy? I did an experiment with my own stories on fin fiction. I took six of them and I went through all the comments and picked out, copied down all the ones that were long and where people seemed to be reflecting on what they felt after the story or what they thought or what were in some way saying something significant about the story at, at length, sort of. And then I went through those comments. I found 118 that seemed significant. And I counted how many people talked about catharsis or anything like catharsis, uh, how many talked about their feelings in general, how many talked about thoughts, sort of abstract ideas like justice or injustice and how many people talked about both feelings and thoughts uh, these are, this is just a list of the six stories i used um, the totals here 61 of these comments over half of them people talked about feelings their feelings be, becoming stronger by watching the story. And the, the great majority of these were sad feelings. They felt sad after Walling watched reading the story. Uh, comments like, boy, that was really a punch to the gut. Or I felt terrible after reading this. Um, catharsis, nobody said really that they felt per J, that they felt relieved. There were three readers who who said something like, oh, well, uh, you know, to get a cathartic effect or um, they, they spoke about catharsis theoretically because they had read the catharsis theory, but nobody actually said they felt cleansed or purged or relieved. There was one person who said a story made him cry in a good way, which is as close as I found to anything like catharsis. And one person said he felt better about himself because the protagonist was such an awful person, basically, or had his own flaws, but even worse than he did. Then there were 14 comments that were just about thoughts and 43 that were relating feelings and thoughts, like abstract ideas and then how they felt about those things. So what I took out of this experiment is uh, readers rarely or never experience catharsis in a tragedy. Um, that's one point. They do experience it in like comedy, adventure, horror, practically anything other than tragedy. Tragedy is like the only, the only genre where people don't have catharsis. And I think that's almost a defining characteristic of tragedy 
is you're left without purgation uh, at the end. What the readers wrote about mostly was ideas that disturbed them. Uh, not just that something sad happened, but there was something, something about how it happened and why it happened that was more disturbing yet. Um, because essentially I'll highlight this as perhaps being the most important uh, point here. The many felt tension at seeing an undeservedly bad outcome, but not seeing any way of avoiding it. And this isn't supposed to happen. You know, bad, we're supposed to have ways of preventing bad things from happening to good people. Uh, we would like to think that if something bad happens to someone, that it's their fault in some way. Uh, and that is in fact the standard theory we used to have of tragedies, of the interpretation of Aristotle's theory until very recently was that tragedies are about people who had a tragic flaw and so something bad happened to them. But if you read the actual tragedies that people are talking about, very often they didn't have a flaw. Uh, they didn't do anything wrong and something bad happened to them anyway. It was unavoidable. And uh, so my feeling is that tragedy is largely about moral paradoxes, not sad fix in general, but, but tragedy, that, that it's doing philosophy, essentially, when we watch tragedy. So yeah, catharsis, well, catharsis is a thing, but people don't really get it from tragedy. And tragedy is not, just about emotions, it is about ideas, it is, it is doing philosophy. I actually, well, I actually think that Aristotle's guidelines on tragedy would prevent you from writing a good tragedy, but going more on that in another day. Uh, in the 10 minutes, I guess, that I have left, is that right, Trick? Trixie, 10 minutes? Um, yeah, I mean, you can take a little longer than that. That's fine. All We've right. got an hour and a half together and. Okay. I really uh, wish. Take about, take about, you know, uh, 17 minutes or so. We can go until like 840. Okay. So I looked into some reasons proposed, uh, some theories about why people like sad stories. One that is popular with scientists in scientific papers is that we like sad stories because they release endorphins. endorphins. Um, uh, people have a response to real life tragedies, to real life sad events of releasing various chemicals in their bodies that make them feel good, that make them feel better at least. And the basic idea behind this theory is, well, you read the sad story and your brain is tricked into releasing these chemicals, but you don't really, after you put the story down, you don't actually have to deal with the bad consequences because they weren't real. They were in the story. And so you get all the good feelings without really having to cope with, you know, horrible life altering consequences. And I put up some long quotes from some different papers on the screen. I, I don't think it's important to read through the actual quotes, just, um, and you could, uh, I don't know how people can contact us after this. I can, I can put up my uh, email, uh, I could type that, I'll type that at the end. Um, I can provide people with, you know, these slides and with these quotes and these references if they want them afterwards. This is just another, another long quotation from another scientific, another article. This was a summary of an article uh, in which people, the researchers showed people a tragic movie versus a boring documentary. And they found that people's pain tolerance increased after watching the tragic movie, which fits with the theory that 
it's releasing endorphins because endorphins increase pain tolerance. I don't know if that's, I don't really like that theory, but uh, because it doesn't, because it makes uh, reading sad stories sound less like philosophy and more like, you know, masturbation. Uh, is that PG rated? That's probably not PG, is it? Or G? It makes, anyway, it makes it sort of sound like a trivial, non-beneficial activity, so, which I don't think it is. I think there's more to it than that. So I looked up some other things people said about why they read sad stories. And uh, now one bunch of them fell into the category of reading a sad story made people feel understood, that they felt like other people had sad things happen to them, had similar sad things happen to them, and it makes them feel not alone in their sadness to read these sad stories. And also, I like this comment, sometimes a cheerful story can seem callous to our pain. If, if you are feeling very sad, a happy story might, might just feel fake uh, and annoy you. Um, another popular idea is that sad stories are educational, that perhaps we are simulating real life when we're reading a story. And so reading, like here's a quote, reading how to deal with sadness helps us learn how to deal with it. Uh, or here's a different approach to this educational view. Uh, this person was talking about a book called The Things They Carried about the Vietnam War, a very sad book. Um, and the person said, but I think it helped me understand a lot more about war and what it does to people. And that it's necessary to go through the sadness to get that understanding. And Aristotle himself said that to learn gives the liveliest pleasure uh, and, and used this actually to explain why we delight in artistic images of things which in the reality would give us pain. Now this, this item is actually going sort of back to feeling understood that uh, those people who are feeling very sad right now uh, can, as, as I said before, like, yeah, a happy ending might feel trite and annoy you with its fakeness when you're feeling sad. A lot of people talked about using the story as a way of um, dealing with issues that you were suffering, but at one, one step removed from you so that you could uh, sort of process some sort of negative emotion without, without feeling it full force. And this one, I didn't, I have a lot of quotes down here. I did not uh, reduce them to one screen, but here's an interesting way of putting it. The fact that the music or, non -in or art is non-interactive is actually an advantage in situations of loss and sadness, since there is no judgment and no probing. And that person is proposing that sad fiction, it's easier to read a sad fiction than to tell someone your sad story, because that person is gonna ask you questions and you, you don't really, you can be afraid to open up to someone else because because opening up is exposing yourself. And here's one of my theories, one that I've, I've definitely have fallen into this category, the I just want to feel something people. Um, people who having been devoid of emotions, feeling nothing, uh, feeling empty is to many people worse than any emotion possibly could be. 
or feeling nothing for a very long time where you um, sometimes you just need to feel something, anything uh, like this last quote, I think is the, this person said, I read sad books to make my cold dead heart feel again. Or, you know, as, as Kurt Cobain said, right? Uh, was it Kurt Cobain who said, I cut myself today just to see if I could feel. Uh, and that's one reason people can read. Actually, that was, uh, that was uh, Johnny Cash. No, that, that was a cover of... Uh, oh, wait, wait. That's right. That's right. <laughs> what am I doing? Um, Johnny wait, Cash who was that a cover? That was Nine Inch Nails. Uh, Nine Inch Nails. Johnny Cash Trent, was Trent, probably Trent Reznor. Right? Yes. Yes, Trent Reznor. Although Kurt Cobain probably could have said it if he thought of it. Probably applies there also. Now, and finally... I wanted to say a few things from an evolutionary psychology perspective, which actually um, nobody brought up in, in comments on Reddit and Quora and such. But as this, you know, this fellow is a scientist writing, uh, commenting on someone else's paper about why people like sad music. Uh, and he said, well, people, oh, this, this was actually an interesting study that I should bring up to point out. Uh, they, they were studying why uh, which people enjoyed sad music and uh, found sort of two personality traits which it required to appreciate sad music. And this might equally well apply to sad fiction. One, that the person is high in empathy. So they had a method for screening their subjects to measure sort of how empathic they were. And the low empathy ones did not enjoy sad music. But high empathy people who had a low ability to sort of abstract themselves from the situation, people who uh, would get would get personally sucked into whatever they were watching. They also did not enjoy sad music because it just made them feel sad and they felt like they wanted to get away from it. So the two character traits that they said allow you to enjoy sad things are A, high empathy, and B, a sort of mental discipline of being able to distance yourself from what you're listening to or what you're reading. But back to evolutionary psychology here, this scientist noted that people who are empathizing with the misfortune of another person are somehow rewarded by the process. And that would be the, the assumption of evolutionary theory. Um, we know that humans need sympathy and they wouldn't survive very well if they didn't get sympathy. So human society must have developed some way of providing people with sympathy. And so it, I would I would conclude that humans must have evolved to feel some attraction to suffering people in order to get them to approach them and give them sympathy. Uh, now the mechanism, now somebody is, is, you know, out there in the audience saying, Oh, group selection and, and, and objecting to this. Right. And, and I don't know what the mechanism is. Uh, what is, you know, and in, evol in evolutionary psychology, that means what is the reproductive reward for being attracted to suffering people? And, you know, I don't have that worked out, but, but uh, there's something there, I think. Um, one final note that I'll make is, I'm saying we read sad stories, we enjoy sad stories. Well, who, who is this we that I'm talking about? I really, 
only been studying it within the Western tradition, right? I have not asked, what do people do in Japan? What do people do in Africa? I'm really only tangentially aware of their literature. Um, and we don't know whether all cultures enjoy sad stories. There are certainly cultures I have encountered for which I have, I have not found sad stories, just looking at you know, compilations of the mythologies. Um, and historical narratives, particularly anything more than like 400, 500 years old, uh, very often shows people finding the suffering of others funny unless they are fellow tribe members in some, and I'm using the word tribe very generally here. Um, and you can see this even in Shakespeare. Uh, for instance, Malvolio uh, in uh, Twelfth Night, uh, it's supposed to be, his suffering is supposed to be funny. Um, Shylock, uh, his suffering in The Merchant of Venice, it's unclear whether it's supposed to be funny, whether Shakespeare wanted that to be funny or sad. Um, and there are really a lot of things in Shakespeare where the audience is supposed to enjoy someone being miserable in a way that seems weird to us today. And, and we can note that at the same time, one of their common you know, pastimes was to tie up a bear and set dogs loose on it and, and you know, stand around and see how long the bear could last or how many dogs he could kill or something. And, and this was entertainment at that time. It, it's, it's pretty rare, as far as I know, in world literature to find stories that invoke sympathy for members of the outgroup. Uh, and the Iliad is a really notable exception, which is sort of the foundational, a foundational, really the foundational text for, for Western uh, culture. Um, I have a couple of curious examples here. One is a book called Peace Child by Don Richardson, I believe. This was told by a missionary to Papua New Guinea who went, was one of the first people to contact the Dani people. This was probably in the late 1960s, maybe 1970. And so he went and lived with the Dani and learned their language and translated, began translating the New Testament into Dani. And he told them the story because he was a missionary. He was there to convert them. So he told them the story in the gospels about Jesus and they thought that Judas was the hero, right? They thought Jesus was, you know, a sucker. And, uh, and they did not, they, they thought this was, a, this was pretty cool, you know, that, that, that Judas had, had pulled one over on Jesus really nice. Uh, and that's, I'm, well, it was an unusual case. Or uh, my brother who was in China for a year told me about how he went out once to the movie theater to watch Saving Private Ryan when it came out in China. And he had to walk out very early on in the movie because uh, they had this horrible uh, war scene of the of D-Day, of the invasion of the Normandy beaches where all these American soldiers are rushing onto the beach and just being, just being cut to shreds by German machine guns. And it's, it's really brutal and gruesome. And he, and the audience was laughing. Everybody was laughing at saving private Ryan. And they, and they thought that this was hilarious. This, this scene of, you know, total, total devastation. And I have, I have no idea why they reacted that way, but I'm just pointing out that we would we would watch that movie and think, oh, of course, everybody will will find this horrifying. And but no, uh, apparently in China it's not horrifying. 
And I have no idea why, but I just want to point out everything that I said may be, you know, culturally specific. And that's, that's all I have to say. How about, and over to Trixie. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I suspect with the Chinese thing, uh, it may just have to do with uh, sort of seeing America taken down a peg almost. Uh, and, you know, when you look at our war machine, so to speak, and uh, the way that uh, the way that we're perceived by other cultures as uh, being extremely warlike to see us, you know, marching a beach and soldiers just getting slaughtered left and right. Um, now, now, obviously, over here, that's really unacceptable. But, um, you know, I've heard stories from people uh, uh, in the East about animosity that exists between different groups there, uh, especially between China and, and Japan and, and Korea. So I'm not, um, I'm not like overly shocked by it, but you know, still, I mean, if I were in a movie theater, that would be, that would be difficult for me to, to take too. And, and I suspect that, um, I mean, I know that there's a lot of variation within, uh, 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 Chinese culture just because I teach a lot of Chinese students and so I see different perspectives. But uh, in any case, uh, I think I will. Um, <clears throat> let's see, what was I going to say? Um, I think I will get started here. I'm going to uh, open up my set of slides. And uh, I'm going to try to get this to work. So uh, people in the audience... Hey, it works. People in the audience, can you... well? That's to you, but the stream does not show up. Can you see it in the stream, or do I need to reduce the size? Anyone still watching in the writing stream audience? I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing any responses. You can see the whole thing. Okay, great, awesome. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the process of actually writing uh, uh, misfortune into fiction. And, and this is going to be a little bit broader than just uh, uh, sad fix and tragedies, but uh, uh, in general, uh, you know, why do we, why do we uh, uh, read? Uh, uh, I think Bad Horse has, has covered in, in good detail. Why do we write uh, stories where terrible things happen? Uh, and especially in fan fiction, I think this is interesting because we tend to use characters that we love and it can be difficult to engage. Um, so Chinchillax is showing, I think uh, uh, in the audience that a little bit of it is being cut off. Yeah. Um, Aspect ratio. Yeah, yeah. So let me, uh, let me try something here real quick. Whoops. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, change the screen resolution to something surprisingly low and maybe that'll fix it. I think you I think you need a four going to 1280 by 720. Okay. Mm. And okay, uh, can you guys see that? Can you see the entire thing? Uh, Chinchillax. People are typing. And <laughs> I, I think you need same a, issue. You see slightly more, but not much. Try to okay. find a, a resolution with a four-three aspect ratio. That's what I chose. No, that I I don't think that's four-three. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is no, no, that no, you, that was like sixteen nine. No, that's three four seven twenty by twelve eighty. That's three by four. Nope, I, I've I've got the calculator. I, no, I'm doing the math here. Okay, well, it, it's fine. I'm gonna do something different anyway. Ten twenty four by seven sixty eight is three four. Yeah, that's what I that's what I said. Uh, where am I? 
Uh, here we are. Okay. So I'm going to do this here. And hopefully you can see most of it now. Is that is that good enough? Guys in the audience? Hmm. You know, I teach computer science for a living. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, this is any easier. Not yet. You need you need more. Okay. How about that? Is that better? It's worse. Um, maybe I need to change the height too. Like this. No change. Oh, you know what? It's because of how I shared it. Hold on. I can fix this. I need to share my entire screen. Okay. So now how about this? Does this work? I'm waiting for a response. Can you see everything yet? I, I see yes. Okay, great. Yes, Someone says too large. Wait, no. All right, well, let's try, how about now? You know, I'm not doing anything. I, I don't know how this is. So I just made a change. And that's good. You can see. Okay. Okay. We're going with that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm seeing your comments at a 10 second delay. Ah, okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense now. Sorry, guys. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pick up uh, uh, where we left off. And yeah. Okay. Looks good. I want to start actually by talking about a show that uh, you may not have seen. I think it's it's probably uh, too far back for, I would guess, about half the audience, judging the, the normal age range in uh, uh, conventions. Uh, but there was a show called Disney's Dinosaurs. Uh, it was a, a, Jim Hen a Jim Henson inspired and uh, produced by his, his company. Uh, it, it appeared shortly after Jim Henson died. And uh, it was basically a, ostensibly it was a sitcom, but it was um, a, a rather dark sitcom, I guess. It was more of a drama than a sitcom, but they, they used, they used, uh, they used the fact that uh, the subject matter involved uh, puppets that were designed in a way to seem appealing to children to allow them to uh, uh, take on uh, uh, darker and more dramatic subjects than you would typically see in uh, network television. So ostensibly it was uh, a, a sitcom, but frequently it wasn't funny. It was, uh, it would touch on issues of the day like um, uh, sex harassment in the workplace, uh, uh, and climate change, which I'll talk about in a second. <clears throat> um, and no one actually thought that they would be able to produce a series like this until uh, uh, the success of The Simpsons. So shortly after Jim Henson died, they started work on this and it aired uh, between 1991 and 1994. Um, My Little Pony, early My Little Pony had uh, uh, some similarities to this in that uh, the writers were able to go to dark places uh, uh, specifically because uh, the story was seen as, or the, the setting was seen as childlike in some sense. And by being technically G-rated, uh, they were able to write in uh, uh, stakes and, and concepts that were darker than you would normally expect. Uh, now, <clears throat> Uh, a couple of lessons that I learned uh, from the show, I didn't really watch a lot of dinosaurs, but 
there are a couple of things that uh, really stuck with me uh, uh, that I happened to see. And uh, one of them was, <clears throat> there was an episode where uh, one of the parents, I, I forget who probably the mother, is uh, reading uh, the baby a story. And uh, the story has a, a moral but a tragic ending to it. And the baby complains that, well, this is a terrible story that you've told me, right? You told me this story with uh, a sad ending to it. And then the parent says, uh, but did you learn something from it? And then the baby thinks about it and says, oh, good story. And the point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that when you're telling a story, what's important about the story ultimately is not what happens to the characters. The characters are part of the medium of telling the story. What's important is what happens to the readers. That's your goal as a writer. Uh, the second thing I'll, I'll mention is just uh, in the process of writing tragedy, uh, how far are you willing to go in, in terms of getting a message across? If you have a message, and, and I'm a message-oriented writer, if you have a message that is important, you may be willing to take more risks or push harder. Uh, and uh, Dinosaurs is uh, actually pretty well known, and those of you who know of it may know of it only for this fact, uh, for the fact that in the final episode, uh, they kill off all of the characters. Uh, and, and yes, that includes the baby. Uh, they all freeze to death uh, due to uh, climate change. And again, this was a show ahead of its time. This was back in 1994 when climate change wasn't even really on, on people's minds yet. This was during, I think, the uh, uh, Bill Clinton uh, uh, presidency. So, uh, you know, the, the severity of the tragedy that they used uh, hit home how dire that the message was. And the writers were willing to pay this enormous price in order to get that message across because they believed that that message was important. Now, this is true in, in fan fiction because you're working with uh, uh, characters that everyone knows and loves. And even though what you're writing is not canonical uh, uh, in a sense, um, it's still, uh, let's see, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, it, it's still relevant and important to your audience that uh, you respect the characters or they aren't going to be, you know, interested in what you have to say. So uh, why read Sad Dark? Well, I think uh, Bad Horse already covered this in great detail. Uh, you know, I, you know, maybe this isn't true, but for me, I certainly don't read fiction in order to feel miserable. Um, I, I think that there there is some truth to uh, what Bad Horse said about, um, you know, feeling something just to feel, that, that people do read sad fiction for that purpose, and, and uh, I can identify that with an extent. Uh, uh, but, you know, we're getting something psychologically uh, out of reading about unfortunate events, even if we don't quite understand where the satisfaction comes from. And uh, moreover, there are many different types of fiction that are uh, uh, either, you know, sad in nature or tragic in nature or uh, uh, deal with uh, dark and disturbing elements. And I think that, that uh, these types of stories are very different from each other. I think they have different purposes, uh, uh, both in terms of what the authors are trying to accomplish and in terms uh, with, uh, you know, why readers read those kinds of fiction. Um, now, for me personally, uh, what got me interested into fiction, which, you know, uh, uh, touches on dark games and topics, was uh, the, the very well-known uh, uh, fanfic, Somewhere Only We Know, uh, which for me provided me, with, pr provided me with some powerful feelings that told me that I have uh, uh, stories of my own that I need to tell and communicate. Now, uh, in the case of Somewhere Only We Know, uh, I remember <clears throat> I told I told someone about the story, uh, and then later I told another brony, I said, oh yeah, I, I said this was a good story to introduce them to fan fiction, and they said, what? You just gave them like the saddest story that exists as, as a gateway to fan fiction. And uh, I thought that was kind of funny. Actually, I think that may have even been 
the con chair <laughs> that uh, uh, gave me that comment. And <clears throat> I, I, I said, well, you know, to me, that story isn't all that sad because there's an element, there's a silver lining to it um, uh, where there's kind of this beauty to this hidden world that they have sort of like, you know, in the ending of Brazil, the guy escapes, quote unquote, if you haven't seen Brazil, you should. It's an excellent movie, and, and uh, it's a great example of tragedy. Uh, but there's still this beauty to the escape, the, the uh, a success despite tragedy. Um, and actually, Bad Horse uh, created a group on, uh, on let, me, let me jump to this. Where did I put? You, you can you know where it is no but you you know what it says uh, right. it you know he created a hopeful group on film fiction uh because there isn't really a film fic tag for stories that are dark but have a silver lining to them or have an an upbeat or a hopeful aspect to them uh and personally i appreciate this because uh i'm often afraid of reading stories with sad and dark tags despite the fact that i, I write a lot of fix that uh, merit at least uh, uh, dark or tragic tags to them. Um, uh, so going back here a few slides to where I was, uh, yeah. So why why write stories like this? Uh, again, I think there are different reasons because there are different goals. Um, there are many different types of stories that make use of these element, uh, elements. Um, and one thing that I would warn you about as a, a potential author, uh, 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 if you're interested in injecting uh, uh, dark into some of the things that you write, or if you're interested in writing, you know, very dramatic uh, a fiction, it's really easy to use uh, tragedy and tragic events to evoke mood. But if the reader realizes that you are toying with their heartstrings, uh, they're not going to appreciate it. And this is especially true in fan fiction. Because with fan fiction, again, you're working with characters that people care about. And, you know, if on page one, you kill off Twilight Sparkle uh, uh, in, in some needless way, uh, you know, this is a, a very cheap way to try to evoke a, a dark mood, uh, if that makes sense. And uh, Chinchillax in the chat has actually posted a link to uh, uh, both Somewhere Only We Know, the, 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 the fiction, and uh, also the uh, hopeful group that Bad Horse uh, manages. Oh, hey, can I make so, a comment? Yeah, can yeah, I make you can a, interject something. Just to complicate the case of Somewhere Only We Know, uh, I, if I recall correctly, and somebody correct me if I'm not, <clears throat> Patchwork Poltergeist, who wrote it, is into S&M. So there might be something else going on. Also, also, keep in mind this is a PG con. Well, I'm not. I'm not getting into some, I know, some I know, specifics, I know. but but then there there is the. It does complicate the question of saying, what, what all is going on in that story, or why, at least for her, you know. Yeah, um, you know, I would say, you know, on that. Without going in again, going into detail, the reason that there are interests that people have romantically that end up being lifestyle oriented instead of just uh, a, a reflection or, or an act uh, is because of the catharsis that's involved with them. Um, you know, I don't want to go into a lot of detail for obvious reasons because of the rating of the con, but it, 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 th that is an interesting aspect. In any case, when you are writing a, uh, uh, sad or dark or mature elements in the fiction uh, uh, of any sort, um, you know, using, using things like character death, uh, these are tools, uh, sort of like a hammer. And, you know, they say, uh, uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, you know, the, the way to use a tool is not to pick up the hammer and walk around looking for nails. The, the way to use a tool is to keep it in your toolbox until the time comes where you can effectively make use of it, right? So, um, you know, I, I, I don't 
write fiction where I start off with the intent of writing something that feels dark or where something sad happens. I, I use elements like that in, in situations where there's a purpose that they serve to the story. And, and I'll get to that in a second. But uh, I tried to identify some different flavors of sad dark because I believe that uh, uh, you know these types of stories can be very different from each other. <clears throat> and the first time I wanna mention uh, just because it, it's definitely not my cup of tea, and I'm not saying that that uh, there's anything necessarily wrong with fiction that does this, but <clears throat> fiction that uses <clears throat> bad things for pure shock value, and here I'm talking about uh, uh, fan fiction or fiction in general, where uh, the worst possible things happen, and uh, it's like, you know, Oliver Twist without, you know, the, the turn that, that goes up. Or, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say almost uh, Franz Kafka's uh, Metamorphosis, mm -hmm. but uh, there it's less shock value and more of an allegory and catharsis, which is uh, uh, coming up in a second. But, uh, you know, stories that are frequently seem needlessly violent, uh, needlessly dark, um, you know, and Oftentimes, most of the time, these stories uh, I find are not very good. Usually they're written by amateurs. Um, they're often grotesque. They're there for, for cheap clicks. They're there to offend people or cause controversy. And I like controversy in fiction. I like it when people argue and debate fiction. But, you know, artificially creating controversy by just doing things that offend people uh, uh, isn't particularly interesting to me. So. For the most part, I, I tend to steer clear of those. Uh, then, uh, again, I can't really go into detail, but clock fix of a certain genre uh, uh, are sort of their own category of, of dark and depressing, but for completely different reasons um, that may go into catharsis to an extent. Uh, separately, uh, for the author's catharsis, not specifically for the reader, but oftentimes uh, authors will write stories to share something that has happened to them. And a lot of my fiction does this. Actually, uh, 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 my uh, husband, Jewel, who uh, is uh, uh, somewhat well known in the uh, 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 pony circles for uh, being a commissioner of certain artwork, I'm not going to uh, uh, give his name, but it has a tag on Derpy Buru. Um, uh, he has a hard time reading my stories because he knows that many of them apply to things that have happened to me in real life. And uh, uh, it, it's depressing to him to not be able to, <laughs> he says, tell them nothing. It's depressing to them, to, to him to uh, not be able to help the characters because he knows that, that part of me is in those characters. Um, but, you know, being able to share a story and to get these events that have happened to you out is, uh, oh, so Bad Horse says in the chat, uh, now he has his own goal, which is to get his own tag on Derpy Buru. I believe in you, Bad Horse. I believe you can do it. Um, you just have to get people reading your story so they'll commission fan art of horrible, horrible things happening. And, uh, uh, you know, someday, someday you'll be there. You, you will live the dream. Um, another reason is to set an overly dramatic mood. Uh, this can be cheap, I think. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to insult anyone's fiction for doing this. I, I think there definitely is a reason for doing this. There, there are reasons for using really dark settings. Probably the, the most obvious example is Fallout Equestria. Um, I, I've heard it mentioned, um, this type of story or storyline. Uh, I think this was in a, a role-playing book talking about, you know, narrators or, or game masters uh, uh, designing uh, role-playing elements uh, in the grim dark, grim dark. Only grim dark is grim dark, meaning you know these stories where everything starts out terrible and it, it's it's going to be terrible, and that setting is there to immediately invoke drama, you know. But drama is not something that is interesting unless you have characters that you you care about. 
Uh, Sunny says, why is friendship is op optimal up here is a sad, dark thing. And I would say because friendship is optimal uh, touches on some pretty dark elements. Um, but uh, here I'm talking about many of the stories that have been written. I have not read, I still have not read the canonical friendship is optimal. Uh, it's very difficult for me to read fiction, much easier for me to write it for reasons that are kind of complicated. But in this case, uh, I, I mentioned this, so this may not be a good example. I may be incorrect, but I know that some friendship is optimal stories uh, are good examples of using dark elements in order to force the characters and the reader to confront some specific moral issues. And uh, many of my stories, probably most of my stories uh, uh, that touch on dark, to dark topics specifically do it uh, in order to address certain moral issues that without those elements, uh, these aren't things that would come up. Uh, uh, these are things that would be held back and suppressed, uh, uh, you know, as we sort of do with the politeness and the niceness of uh, society. Ben Hoare says that the grimness of Fala Equestria is well justified. And uh, in, in the chat, he's saying this. And, and you know, again, uh, I, I think that's very likely true. Um, well, I, can I relate it to what oh, you yeah, just said? So you just said the the darkness, the sadness can be there to push some, to address some moral issue, to highlight some moral issue. Yes. And the, the basic idea, I think, behind Fallout Equestria is you're combining this awful world of Fallout and perhaps the original Fallout theory series would be a better sort of target for yeah. criticism for being overly grim with ponies. And the whole story is asking the question how did this happen? How did, how did the utopia of Equestria change to a, uh, you know, this horrible post-apocalyptic world? And the, the heroine spends most of the novel slowly discovering what happened and why it happened. And, the, and one of the main themes of Fallout Equestria which That's I think is, is great because nobody else in literature ever does this. Like this never occurs outside of fine fiction is they, is they said there was, there was no evil overlord. There was no, it's not because there were evil people out there doing evil things. It was just mistakes and misunderstandings and bad luck. And, and that the, the whole search for, people to blame is just perpetuates the situation. I think that's and, and actually, that's, that's a pretty common human imperative is, is this search for uh, a way to blame the terrible misfortune that we see around us on something to have, to be able to name something, to be able to, uh, you know, identify a target and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, that's certainly pressing right now. I mean, we're seeing, uh, like, I mean, America's in flames at the moment, as I give this, and, and Bad Horse and I both live in, in uh, Central America. Uh, Central America. We live in, <laughs> in Middle America. We live in, in the middle of the United States. And, uh, you know, uh, people are still struggling with some really basic human rights issues. And, you know, fan fiction, fan fiction is important. I mean, uh, if you haven't read a lot of fan fiction, or if you haven't read the right fan fiction, if you haven't been reading uh, uh, good authors, um, you know, it might surprise you that these issues are issues that writers tackle. And finding a way to tackle them through ponies is particularly difficult because of the setting. But that's also what makes it so interesting. And I'm going to get to that in a second, but let, let me just uh, uh, wrap this up real quickly, this part of it. Um, <clears throat> another uh, uh, purpose for uh, writing dark fiction is uh, to give the characters extreme adversity in order to showcase, you know, uh, uh, them finally overcoming this because the release, when, when a story doesn't end up completely tragic, when there is a positive resolution or even a neutral resolution if things are, are particularly terrible, uh, the darker the story was, the, the, the lower the low point, uh, 
you know, the higher the high point becomes. Again, it, you know, if it's properly written, but uh, in any case, uh, sometimes, and, and the show does this. I mean, we've seen the show uh, uh, do things where all of a sudden, you know, in page one of the writer's notes for an episode, the stakes are the lives of everyone in Equestria, like like all of a sudden. And and so, uh, uh, yeah, okay. So that's all I want to say there. Um, let me move on before, I, I, you know, I want us to get to... Uh, 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 some questions at the end here, so I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit. Uh, there are also many degrees of sad dark. So, uh, you know, there used to be no drama tag on film fiction, and so people would use the sad tag for dramas, and dramas aren't really sad all of the time. There, there are sad elements, but they don't necessarily make you cry. They may uh, uh, you know, create some tension, but ultimately good things can happen. Uh, sad dark figs can range from things that are extremely dark and sad, again, like Kafka's Metamorphosis, um, to stories where the characters do actually win in the end or learn valuable lessons that make that trip worthwhile. And again, to plug uh, Bad Horse's uh, hopeful group, which I, I think has some really interesting stories in it because it targets that uh, a specific genre or sort of subgenre of uh, fan fiction. Now with fan fiction, the extra challenge that you have that makes it more difficult. You know, one of the things that makes fan fiction easier is you have established setting, you have established characters, you don't have to world build or create those characters. That makes things much, much easier on you. As a writer, you can start, you know, in, in chapter, uh, uh, for like like Star Wars, you, you can pick up in the middle and and go and everything makes sense. But if you're trying to write things that go beyond what the show would do, you have to do it in a way that fits the genre and characters properly. Uh, and uh, this can be challenging. Uh, how do you do dark and still make things feel like friendship is magic? And I, I think a good example, I guess I'll plug just one of my stories here is uh, my RCL feature Motherly is a pretty good example, I think, of uh, uh, doing this in a way that it, it actually works. Uh, but you have to see it, and I'm going to talk about some of the, the elements behind you know, how I approach this now. Um, now, I will mention that when I first started writing, it was difficult for me to uh, uh, envision conflict. Um, I didn't want anything bad to happen to the characters because, well, these are characters I care about, you know? And I've seen writers who do this, who they only write things that uh, happen to characters that are good things. You know, every day is a good day. There's not a lot of conflict or the conflicts are very minor. Um, most of these authors aren't, you know, super good or, or, or write particularly memorable fix. But uh, it, it can be difficult to step out of that role because you care about these characters. Uh, one big trick of mine that I use uh, to keep my dark fiction firmly in Pony, and you know I do this in, in Motherly as well, is I am trying to make sure that when bad things happen, they always happen for a reason that's specifically related to the underlying goodness of the show. This, this leads to a lot of apparent paradoxes. It, it leads to situations where the question I'm asking is, how does something uh, this bad happen? Or how does something bad like this happen in a world uh, you know, that's painted in the way that, that friendship is, is magic is painted? I, I see that people are having... Um, People are having problems with the stream, so hopefully that gets uh, fixed. Uh, I'm just going to keep talking, I think, unless... Uh, I Well, there's a 10-second delay, too, so I'm not going to know. Um, okay, I guess I'm just going to keep talking, and, uh, you know, we'll see what happens. All right. Uh, someone in the, the, the audience, by the way, mentioned, uh, remember that old writing advice from Equestria Daily, you need to have 
bad, terrible things happen to your ponies, even Fluttershy, especially Fluttershy. And, and this is because, well, Fluttershy is a, a meek and tragic sort of character, uh, a, a femme fatale, if you will. And, and uh, she's so beloved, it's difficult to do bad things to her, so to speak. And, and that is kind of a funny quote, actually. But uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you've got to find a way to tie it to the show. You have to find a way to make it make sense. Now, some advice that I have to keep uh, uh, dark from being overpowering. With the exception of stories that are pure horror, and I've written three of these and put them uh, uh, on my account, and, and I'm not a huge fan of, of any of them, uh, except the most recent one, I think, is, is interesting because it also talks, it also touches on some other disturbing topics that I, I want to, that I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, give people feels about. But uh, with the exception of pure horror stories, I think bad things should always happen for a reason. There, there should be some reason provided, even if that reason is to get across the message that something sometimes bad things happen to good people. Uh, for example, with my own literature, I'm not going to kill off a character unless they had a life well lived. If it's a, if it's like, you know, a main six character and it's not because I can't do it, but uh, you know, I, I don't have any interest in taking characters down to a low point and then, you know, murdering them and uh, trying to make the audience sad. My goal is never to make the audience feel sad. It's to make the audience feel things based on the concepts and messages that I'm trying to get across. And, and the ponies are the medium for doing that. They're not um, an end into themselves. And, you know, maybe for other writers, this is different. Maybe the, there are writers, I'm, I'm sure there are, maybe most writers write stories because they want certain things to happen to certain characters. But that isn't the goal that I have when I'm writing. In most of the stories that I write, bad things happen. <clears throat> I try to turn it on its head, actually. I, I try to make it as paradoxical as possible. I want bad things to happen specifically because every pony is looking out for every pony else's best interest. So uh, this is where the interesting moral questions arise for me. And you know, uh, I'm not going to go into detail because we need time for questions. But uh, you know, I, I do this in some of my works, and I think Mother Lee's one good example. So you know, I'll, I'll definitely stop. Uh, at this point. So I, I do want to, the last thing I want to say is remember, you don't get rainbows without light shining through the darkness of rain. You know, I, I, friendships aren't defined by what happens in good times. They, they're defined by chaos, really. They're defined by what happens when things are bad. Um, okay, so that's enough. Uh, let's, uh, I, I'd like to take some questions from the audience now for, for either one of us. I, I mean, we can both uh, talk about them. Let me stop the share so you can see our smiling faces here. Um, uh, bad Horse says, can you give us examples of bad things happening because every pony is looking out for every pony else? Um, I'm trying to think of a non-mature fic that I have written <laughs> uh, <laughs> where... And, and I'm not I'm not talking about like like plot fictions or porn. I'm I'm, I'm just talking about fictions where uh, things are are somewhat extreme. Um, you know, in some of my fiction, I write situations where people in positions of power, be they uh, you know alicorns, be they heads of state, be they uh, uh, parents versus their children uh, do things because they are looking out for the best interests of their children or their friends or the people underneath them. And this is what leads to problems. And, uh, you know, that's sort of a, a, a general case. Uh, most of the situations I write about are more specific cases of those, but uh, they tend to be situations where morally speaking, two people have very different ideas about what is morally acceptable. One person may say, well, what's most important to me is that you survive, that, that you are able to live. Uh, and to the other person, what's most important to them may be their autonomy, or it may be you know, their ability to 
you know, consent to what happens to them. And, and there are numerous stories that I've written that, that touch on the, the aspect of what's more important, living or aspects related to the life you live, whether or not, you know, you continue to live. Uh, and, and this comes up a lot in the show because, not in the show, but, you know, the overtones of the show because of the whole immortality thing, you know, death is a part of life. It, it, it's something that everyone experiences and you can't write a fictional universe where every pony lives forever all the time and have it still be interesting. Uh, there needs to be loss. There need to be low points. Uh, uh, and it, it's interesting how much of the debate this provokes. Every time it comes up in one of my stories, people violently argue, which by the way is, is one of the ways I, I measure success <laughs> in something that I've written is, is how, how much people argue with each other over whether or not a, a character's actions were justified. Um, uh, but in any case, uh, l let me hear some questions from uh, uh, the audience. I think that uh, probably people have, I, I know there's a bunch of people, I, I don't know how many, I see 41 staff and I can't scroll down. Um, but I consider my salt on Aristotle's concept and active hubris. Uh, I think everything every human being does is hubris. So uh, I think that that qualifies, yes. Oh, he's asking Bad Horse, sorry. Bad Horse says uh, hubris is my middle name uh, uh, because uh, I, apparently he forgot he has a microphone. Bad hubris horse, I guess that's uh, what we have to call you now. No, he just likes typing. Okay, any questions from the audience? Any questions? No, no questions in the writing stream audience? There's a lot of people here, some of them asleep. Oh, a friend of mine who is not into ponies but showed up anyway is typing something. And some other people. It's a race. It might happen. What's my most successful story and why? There's different types of success when you write fan fiction. Um, Which one did you get paid the most for? I didn't get paid for any of them. Uh, the most award-winning one is, is The Price of a Smile, which is definitely dark and it ends, it, it is a tragedy, but it, it gives me goosebumps. The ending for me gives me goosebumps. Um, do I always start with a message? So I don't know about Bad Horse, but I always start with a message. Like I, I have something that I have an idea that is clawing its way out of me and I have no choice but to put fingers to, to keyboard. Um, it, it just comes out like, like a baby, uh, unannounced. I have, I always want to end up with, I hesitate to use the word message. Um, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, a message sounds to me like, like, you know what you want to say, like you have an answer to something. And so I, I think there's two basic approaches to fiction throughout history. There have been, there have been one group of people like Plato is one, who, you know, is the big name in this group who believes that when you write fiction, you should have a point to make and you should have a, like a moral argument, not even a, an argument, but a, a truth that you are stating. And you would find this like all through uh, medieval morality plays. Oh, and Bad Horse, can I, can I very briefly interrupt you just to answer a question on, on the uh, writing stream audience? Someone mm -hmm. said, uh, my FinFic profile shows I have six horror stories, uh, three of them in specific are only horror, where that's the the more or less the only purpose or the purpose is, is very, very directly horror. Um, those would be uh, the recent one that I just wrote, uh, Winter Heat, um, No Choice, which is uh, a little mini fic, and 
Um, one that's really popular about a foal, and I can't remember. Um, it's got Twilight Sparkle and Rarity, and there's a foal um, named Daylily. I can't remember, but if you search for Twilight Sparkle and Rarity and Horror, you should find it. Um, go, go ahead, Bad Horse. Well, that some people think you should write a story to tell people things, to answer questions, and other people think you should tell a story to ask questions. And I'm one uh -huh. of the people who thinks, who wants to write stories more to ask questions than to answer them. So uh -huh. if I say no, that- I, I agree, I agree yeah. with both of those. But, but definitely, I mean, I, I try to, you know, I, I want people to think, I mean, that's the goal. Princess Day, that was the one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I, so I won't start with a message so much as with a question. And sometimes, fairly often, uh, I don't know what the story is really about or what my message might be until after I've written the whole thing. And then I sit and I think about it for a few weeks and then I suddenly realize what the story might be saying, and then I have to go back and rewrite the whole thing. But yeah, but yeah, I don't. Well, I, I gotta. I, I want to uh, cut you off real quick, just so I can very quickly before everything runs off, uh, because we're almost out of time. Yeah. I want to answer uh, a few little questions. Do you think escapism is an influence in people reading dark fix? Uh, I, I definitely do. Um, and actually, there's a, an amusing The Onion article that talks about during the Great Depression, people reading H.P. Lovecraft because uh, it whisks them away to a fantasy world. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of times dark stories can be better 